Does the road wind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Will the day's journey take the whole long day? From morn to night, my friend. She walked along this very path, which was the bridge between life and death. In two small steps, she had crossed the barrier, and her mortal frame, riddled with bullets, lay in a river of blood. Today, this path is a crystallized river in her memory. With love and veneration, she continues to live in the memory of the Indian people. और सबसे बड़े प्यार के साथ मैं समझाती थी हर एक काम के लिए का, काम के लिए कि भाई ये ये काम ऐसे करना है ऐसे करना है और जब भी कहीं से फूल आता था वो मेरे को बुलाती थी पहले कि भाई ये फूल यहाँ लगाना है ऐसे लगाना है जब भी वो बाहर निकलती थी नंगे पैरों आती थी मैंने कहा भाई बड़े भाग हैं हमारे जो कि ऐसे आदमी के साथ हमारा मुलाकात हुई है या हमारा संजोग है कि जो बातचीत करने के लिए मिल रही है वो सेकुलरिज्म की बहुत बड़ी पुजारण थी वो चाहती थी कि इस देश में कोई भी गरीब ना रहे और हर इंसान को इंसाफ मिले वो तो हमारे देश की नेता नहीं थी वो आज दुनिया की नेता थी सबकी नेता थी सबकी प्यारी थी हिंदुस्तान में कई धर्म हैं कई जाति हैं कई तरह के लोग हैं इन सब को इकट्ठा रखना एक बहुत ही मुश्किल काम था और इंदिरा जी ने अपने समय में इन सब को इकट्ठा करके एक ऐसा एग्जाम्पल दिया है दूसरे नेताओं के लिए आने वाले भारत के लिए वो शायद कोई नहीं दे सकता और औरत थी औरतों को उन्होंने मतलब मान दिया औरतों को ऊँचा मतलब बढ़ाया औरतों को हर चीज़ का उन्होंने चांस दिया मतलब कि औरत नीचे ना रहे मर्द से भी ऊपर पक्के रहे उनके होने से कभी पता ही नहीं चला था हमें जातवाद में कोई फ़र्क है हमारे बीच में आपस में उनके होने से ना कोई हिंदू था ना मुसलमान सब एक दूसरे के भाईचारे से रह रहे थे In Allahabad on November 19th 1917 Indira Priyadarshini was born nurtured in her childhood by men like Motilal Nehru Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal she imbibed their high ideals from the very beginning Indira Gandhi was like a sister to me we had both grown up in the midst of freedom struggle under the influence of gandhi ji jawahar lal ji and then we had both come in politics social service was also an area in which we had many things in common she was a very intelligent woman and a very brave woman she became a good mother and she was a very good and devoted daughter who looked after her father for many years as the hostess she used to say that my father was a saint i am a politician and she was a very good politician but may i say though she was a politician and took advantage of the situation whenever she could she had certain basic values she had retained certain basic values of the freedom era she was an uncompromising patriotic person who could never tolerate communalism or atrocities on harijans or anything of that kind i was at indore at kasurba gram when we got the news that she had been attack by her own security men and we were holding prayer meetings and what not that she may recover but unfortunately she did not survive it was a great pity so far as india and her congress was concerned but so far as she herself was concerned i think she could not have asked for a better end on this day 6 years ago On a scrap of paper found in her desk she had written If I die a violent death as some fear I know the violence will be in the thought and action of the assassin not in my dying
for no hate is dark enough to overshadow the extent of my love for my people and country. I had the good fortune to be with our ex-Prime Minister Srimati Indira Gandhi and to have with her, be with her for quite a long time. And I could see that she was so at home with the poor. She felt as if they are her own kith and kin. Once we were travelling by car in South Gujarat in the tribal belt and she just said stop the car. She heard the voice of a tribal lady who was asking her to stop. None of us heard. And then the tribal lady came to her and garlanded her and said, I have been garlanding your photograph for last nine years. Today, I have the good fortune to garland you. And then she started crying. Indiraji was also with tears. And then that tribal lady said, you have done so much for us. God bless you. And then she told me, Nirmala, these are the people who give me the strength. And once in Chikmangalur, Karnataka, a sea lady, she just stopped the car and said, come and visit our hut. I said, we have no time, we had some program. But once some one from that class invites Indiraji, was sure to go. She just went to that hut. And then the tribal lady was so happy, she called all the ladies from the uh, village and she told Indiraji, we used to eat the leaves of those trees for months together. But you have increased our wages, now we are eating rice. But we should also do something. You have done for us, but it's our duty to do something for us and also for the nation. Then she said, oh, how educated she is, better than the city people. Our villagers may not be literate in the formal sense, but they have a cultural literacy and I'm really struck by them. So I used to find that she was really so at home with the poor, that as if they were her kith and kin. I first met uh, Indira Gandhi when she was probably barely 20 years old. She was on her way to Kashmir with her aunt and she stopped by in the hall where I was practicing as a lawyer. And she came to my uh, flat for tea where I had invited uh, some Punjab leaders like Dr. Saifuddin Kishlu and some others. I still have that photograph with me. Now what I recall of her, a few things that struck me about Mrs. Uh, the first was her extraordinarily good looks. Uh, the older she became, the more beautiful she looked. Uh, and she was impeccably well dressed. I have not seen another woman who dressed with greater taste. A line which I always quoted in my articles on her come from uh, Hilaire Belloc's description of a beautiful woman which do don't, doesn't use a single word about her looks. Uh, it runs as follows. Her face was like the king's command when all the swords are drawn. She had that regal something about her which I haven't uh, seen in any other woman I've met. And besides being uh, well-dressed, she had many feminine interests. She was very keen on seeing jewellery, which she never wore. I happened to be in a house when the Nizam's jewellery, which was uh, at that time to be auctioned, was brought to her. She asked to be able to see it. And I happened to turn up there and she had it all out. And she said, would you like to see the Nizam's jewellery? And the way she was looking over it, and I could see that she would have liked to have own this kind of thing, those emeralds and diamonds, and would have liked to warn them if she was not a Prime Minister of India, because she felt it as her duty to wear just khadi, silk or whatever it is, and as little jewellery uh, as possible. Well, six years, my memories of her are still very sharp. And it was a great experience to be with her because she was a remarkable person and her qualities uh, 
you know, I, I always do wonder that how she used to do such a lot of work and how she could sort of, you know, pack, pack so many things in a, such a short period. And uh, the secret really lay that she was an extremely organized and disciplined person. And, uh, you know, she knew exactly how much, and a very economical person, so that in a very uh, short time she could do lots of things. And uh, so that is why she never wasted any minute. It does not mean that, you know, she's all the time very tense and uh, uh, working, working sort of, you know, day and night. Well, she was working a great deal, but uh, she knew how to, how to sort of, you know, even the relaxation of the family and the work and even arranging class and, you know, and how to sort of bring in little bit points of relaxation. And not that she always used to feel that, you know, relaxation does not mean that, you know, you just have to sit idle and do nothing because she felt that is no relaxation for her. And for her, relaxation really meant doing something different for a short time. So that, you know, even if she's working uh, hard, for a short while she listen to music and while listening to music she may even be reading something or uh, or sort of being with her grandchildren for a short while or going in a, if she feels that the paintings are not properly uh, adjusted or arranged she'll go and look at that arrangement or some flowers so for sh after a short while she comes back to her work and she's refreshed so she always you know and that was the really secret and i think it's not a secret but i think it's a cultivation uh, of uh, the qualities and which i think right from her childhood and then she cultivated them further and uh, the more and more work coming to her and she really uh, she could sort of really accommodate so many things uh, together. She never wanted any facility during tours. She would eat anything, sleep anywhere. And uh, I was really, sometimes I would like to provide at least some basic uh, facilities for her during our long tours. But she would simply refuse. She said, I'm used to it. And in one of the tours, for one month we didn't sleep, whole month. And one could find her fresh in the morning. I said, from where did you get this strength, spiritual sadhana? And she would just smile. She said, these things one is not supposed to tell. I said, well, but I, I can make out. It's your spiritual pursuit, the sadhana, that gives you inner strength. And for, I could see that for any, I shouldn't say, any, any other small leader would want, would like to have at least some facilities during the tours, but she would just sleep on the, sleep on the bench and eat in her own, making her plate, her hand, her plate and take puris and just eat like that. And if I would say, I'm so sorry, I have not kept plate today. So said, what's there? We are all Indians, we are used to that. So I was really amazed. She would never complain about anything. I said, from where did you, uh, could you learn all that? She would just smile and say, well, perhaps, I, I was a very poor person in my previous birth and I have still kept that tradition and then we would have a hearty laugh. Her vision extended further than the physical boundaries of time and space. She sat with the best scientists in brainstorming sessions and evolved ways of improving the quality of life for her countrymen. The scientific community really owes a great deal towards the development which has taken place during her tenure as Prime Minister and as Minister for different departments of science and technology. We have a great admiration for her decision making, the kind of trust she had on scientists and the kind of responsibilities she gave to each one of us who were looking after the different departments. Her knowledge about oceans, because I was directly dealing with the ocean development program, 
Her knowledge about oceans was really admirable. I really do not know how she used to get the feedback, but uh, she knew what was going on in the world and also she used to give her ideas in developmental work. One of her programs in which she was most interested was the Antarctic. I was asked to organize the department right from its inception and to lead the first Antarctic expedition. In that connection, I had very intimate uh, contacts with her and uh, I used to see her very frequently and I found that uh, some of the suggestions she gave in that connection were not only to the point but uh, really they improved uh, the work and the situation. The creation of scientific temper and spirit of new discovery was always kept in the context of the people. Being Prime Minister of a country as vast and diverse as India was a Herculean task. With a population of 800 million and frontiers of 15,000 kilometers, with 4,000 towns and 5 lakh villages, with 250 languages and dialects, and innumerable castes, clans, and religions. It was like an ethnological museum. Overwhelmed by the diversities of the Indian social scene, European writers had tended to dismiss Indian unity as a figment of the imagination. The poet Iqbal, however, verifies this innate Indianness. <laughs> दौरे जमा हमारा यूनान और मिस्र रोमा सब मिट गए जहां से बाकी मगर है अब तक नामो निशान हमारा आ स्पिरिट इज अलाइव योर फॉर्च्यून हैज बीन आवर वर्स्ट फो ग्रीस इजिप्ट एंड रोम आर डेड सिविलाइजेशंस बट वी स्टिल लिव एज अ क्रिएटिव फोर्स Enormous energy was channeled into the task of keeping the country unified. She went everywhere, through the length and breadth of the country, in the humblest hut, in riot-torn villages, in flood-ravaged hamlets. She appeared at the right time to give succor to the afflicted. She went to all the places of worship with equal regard and respect. For her, this Sarva Dharma Samabhav, respect for all religions, was so natural. She used to visit temples, mosques, gurdwaras, churches, and I used to accompany her. And I would find that when we visited the Banaras temple, Vishwanath temple, for two hours she did that puja and just sat in the Padmasan. And when we visited Gurudwara, one could feel as if she was a devout Sikh. And in mosques, one used to find that she was a Muslim and the same in the church. It was, it was not just a, a, a principle or a policy for her, but a living faith. She felt that really speaking the foundations of national integration, secularism, or in a way everything really are laid in children. So a couple of years, you know, before, I mean, she had uh, encouraged, with her encouragement and inspiration, a project was started as a community singing for school children all over India. <coughs> and the idea was that the children should sing songs together of different languages. So then the South, they sing songs of the Eastern India, Northern India, Western India, and in the same way in other regions. So that when you are learning uh, and singing together songs of different languages, you appreciate the languages of different regions, you appreciate the feelings and the poets of different regions. She had faith in the country, faith in the people, and faith in the secularism of our country. A country like India, which is so diverse, with so many religions, languages, culture, caste and creed, she believed that the real future of our country lies 
in a costless society which was the future of our country and her idea of national integration was really very deep rooted in her thoughts and in her actions. There are many good things which we can remember about her and many things which we can learn from her. The foremost among them being a woman can stand on her own feet, a woman can make her own decisions, a woman can be courageous, a woman can be above the pettiness, narrow pettiness of caste and creed and treat all human beings alike. In today's grim situation in the country, we need to remember Gandhiji, Nehruji, Indira Gandhi and Lal Bahadur Shastri, people who stood for the basic values of our freedom era. Those values alone can pull us out of the difficulties in which we have landed ourselves. She was quite definitely above any kind of prejudice, religious, communal, linguistic, it didn't even cross her mind that uh, uh, there could be anything like that. I think it was a kind of inheritance she had from her father, who was also above co communal prejudice, and an enormous amount of dignity. Uh, I remember particularly after the Bangladesh War of Liberation, there was no uh, chest thumping or uh, celebration of great victory. She did it in such a quiet, dignified way and that you could hardly believe that India had won an enormous and spectacular victory. Uh, uh, I had again, again occasion to cross swords with her at this time because she was not releasing the prisoners of war, Pakistani prisoners of war, over 90,000 held by us under the pressure of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman because he wanted to get his terms from Pakistan. And I started a campaign in favor of releasing the prisoners of war she sent one for me from Bombay. I came to see her and with a delegation. And uh, she told me, she said, uh, Mr. Singh, your activities are very embarrassing to me. So I said to her, Mrs. Gandhi, that's the whole object of my exercise. I want to embarrass you. You have no right to hold 90,000 prisoners of war after the war has been won. And she said, you might be a very good editor, but you don't know the first thing about politics. So I said, Mrs. Gandhi, you may be right, but I am convinced that anything which is morally wrong cannot be politically right. So she just looked down very disdainfully at me. I thought she'd never talk to me again. But a few months later, she came to Bombay and there was a large reception for her at the Raj Bhavan uh, by Ali Yawar Jung. She sought me out to the party talked to me for a, uh, at great length and the following few months she was the one responsible for giving me the Padma Bhushan. She was in all respects a very great woman. For her, uh, the whole earth was like her home and like the, uh, as a follower of the Vedas, she was thrilled when she read this that the whole earth is like a small family where people belonging to different faiths, speaking different languages, live like members of one family. And she was not only a true Indian, but one could see that she was a true earth citizen, a citizen of the world. That is what she was, too dear for the earth to carry for too long. Sixty-seven years, of which over half a century was given to India. At the end, she identified with the masses, with the flora and fauna, with the mountains and streams. It was in the words of the poet. यूं घुमा होता है बाजू है करोड़ों मेरे और आफाक की हद तक मेरे तन की हद है दिल मेरा कोह दमन दस्त चमन की हद है Prema Mai 
माता 